G'day folks, it's been a while since our last rendezvous. With the incredible success of Holesworthy Live and all of the attention and hoes I got as a consequence seriously distracted me. But, I took a very spiritual journey to Africa, very much like Chappelle, and I rediscovered what my priorities are. It turns out, it's actually to hang out with you guys. But let's be real, I got lazy. But, but, hold up, this video is definitely going to be worth the wait. Let's talk about a topic that gets such little media attention that I felt the need to bring it to the mainstream. You may as well quit Farid Zakaria, the Leland Chin of America. Your educated sounding accent isn't fooling anyone. We know you're a confirmed Illuminati. By the way, while we're on the topic, so is Leland Chin. Fact. Just a disclaimer before we dig in. This video is not about Black Lives Matter in an Australian context. That video may come later. Let's not forget, I watch too much Fox News to pay attention to what's happening around me. Particularly when my news feed is filled with sick AOC burns. So, you ready to get woke? Grab your popcorn, because this is some real viral shit. It's not. It's actually one of the more boring sociological analysis of the topic. But... I think it's crucial to knowing why it's easier for a cop to kill a black person in a hood extrajudicially in a country that was built on ideas of rule of law. Hopefully what you'll take away from this video is that racism alone isn't responsible for this sort of policing, but something even more sinister. Being so economically insignificant that the ruling class does not give a slightest bit of shit about you, unless of course it's election season. Before we can understand the role of black America in American society, what we really need to look at is what the foundations of American society are. Once we know that, then we can look into how African Americans fit into this structure. Samuel Huntington, if you haven't heard of him, is an explosive personality in the academic world mostly for his infamous book called A Clash of Civilizations, which predicted that the post-Cold War era of the world will be dominated by a rivalry of cultural supremacy. As you can imagine, this was not well received by my side of politics. Because we're busy advocating for a borderless world where everyone sings Imagine like Wonder Woman. There are merits to Huntington's arguments, and a lot of things I disagree with, but this video is not about that. Huntington wrote another book which largely goes ignored because of the reputation he got from Clash of Civilizations. Who are we? Irrespective of what your opinion is on Huntington, this book is an incredible read. Because in my view, it correctly clears a misunderstanding about the foundations of American creed. We always look at the US as a land of immigrants, where you can be from anywhere in the world but you are still as American as it can get. That's partly true, but Huntington says that America was not founded by immigrants, but settlers, and in particular, British Protestant settlers, who came to North America to establish a society from scratch. This distinction is important, because if one is to say that America was formed by immigrants, then theoretically, American national identity should be very malleable, it would change shape based on the cultural values of the immigrants. But if we say that America was formed by settlers, then the ground rules for these immigrants were already laid out to be followed. British settlers brought with them very British sensibilities, like rule of law, or the idea of Protestant ethics in day-to-day -day life. Would America be the America it is today if the 17th or 18th centuries it had been settled not by British Protestants, but French, Spanish, or the Portuguese Catholics? The answer is no. It would not be America, it would be Quebec, Mexico, or Brazil. What Huntington is arguing over here is that American identity is not an amalgamation of different cultures, but in fact, a distinct society based on sensibilities that are very British and Protestant. Now, one of the crucial sensibilities that was mandated by the settlers stemmed from the idea of Protestant work ethic. There has been a lot of commentary on this idea, but basically it means that growth of capitalism goes hand in hand with Protestants. 
as the secular nature of Protestants and their pursuit of business success through their work ethic allows a capitalist society to flourish. After all, England was the birthplace of capitalism. Look, you don't have to agree with this idea at all, but what you need to know is that the founding fathers of America believed it to be true. That's where the idea of pursuit of happiness comes from. It's a pursuit of happiness. So what is pursuit of happiness? Well, let's ask Will and Jaden Smith, an intelligent black man who is living in extreme poverty through his hard work becomes a multimillionaire because clearly all billionaires are also extremely happy. But the story of Will Smith in pursuit of happiness, according to American sensibilities, is the model citizen that would make founding fathers proud. Besides the fact that they'd be shocked to know that Will Smith doesn't have to pick Cotton for Leo. Alright, I get it. I watch Hollywood too much. I could be a Flavoy Zizek. But it's the exercise of this Protestant work ethic that is engraved into American psyche. And even ours to some extent. So what happens if you're a black man living in a hood that barely contributes to the American capitalist machinery? In other words, you refuse to pursue happiness. Well, the ruling elite, to be honest, does not give a fuck about you. Because are you even American if you're on food stamps? Let's say you get shot. The assumption will be that you were up to no good. After all, you fit all the deviant character traits. We know that the American dream essentially revolves around being enterprising and making money. If you're not seen to be attempting this, your value of life is less than someone that is seen to be embodying the American dream. The reason why predominantly black men and women fall into the unproductive category and are much more likely to be killed in the manner that George Floyd was is the tragic story of the marginalization of African Americans by the American ruling class. The story obviously begins with the transatlantic trade. African slaves that were shipped to the Americas should be looked at from a different angle than the slavery practiced in the rest of the known world of Asia and Europe at the time. Transatlantic trade had a special modern quality to it. It was neoliberal as fuck. Slave trade was only part of this trade. West Africa at this time predominantly found a sense of identity and loyalty through kinship and kingdoms rather than a shared African identity throughout the continent. Kingdoms would fight for land and power and enslave people from the losing side. These slaves would be traded with Europeans for goods like superior weapons these slaves would be taken to the Americas as quickly and cheaply as possible, resulting in horrific conditions for the slaves and traded in the Americas for goods like coffee, tobacco, cotton, and riches like gold and silver from the mines. These goods would be taken back to Europe for selling and buying more goods to take to Africa for the next shipment. This trade circuit became so profitable that West African economy, that was previously a relatively wealthy mineral export one, became predominantly a slave supplying economy. And the rulers of Africa bought more weaponry to enslave more of their fellow people to trade with Europeans. These kingdoms eventually started to wage war with each other, just to capture more people for the trade. The continent started to literally become depopulated, particularly of young men. To give you an idea of how insane the slave trade had become, when most of the slave trade ended post-Civil War, Africa went through its worst recession in history, causing political instability that arguably still echoes in modern African politics. The reason for this humongous volume of trade was because the American economic model was highly dependent on slaves to produce goods to be traded back with Europe. This means that the American demand for slaves was the same as a junkie looking to score meth. African slaves and their story in South and Central America is brutal too. In a newly independent US, slaves proved to be what oil was in the post Second World War era, the driver of the economy. Now although the ruling class of Europe believed in ideas of equality and all men being equal blah blah blah, as harsh as this sounds, they did not look at African slaves as men or people, but as commodities. It's not that they weren't aware that Africans long for freedom just like any other person, but they knew that if Africans were not looked as commodities, the entire US economy collapses. You see, they were settlers. 
that had the explicit purpose to make US attractive enough for migrants to leave Europe and make this epic harsh journey. So they made it attractive by not compensating the value created by slaves and using that to subsidize white migrants that came from Europe. Crucial to the US identity became the brutal exploitation of slaves. And because the exploitation was so inherent to the economic model, that racism towards Africans as inferior beings was encouraged as a state policy. In fact, immigrants that were coming from Europe that were no longer just from English-speaking backgrounds, in order to assert their loyalty and belonging to this new land, proved their nationalism by being even more harsh towards African slaves. Now, the common belief is that this all ended when a more enlightened North began to realize the injustice of this system and a brave man named Abraham Lincoln rose up, fought with the regressive South to free slaves and end racism. This is where I'm afraid you've been told a very narrow interpretation of history. The fact is that around mid 19th century, the opinion of US ruling class regarding the economic model began to fragment. The more industrial North felt that in order to increase the size of the economic pie, they needed to process the goods that they were selling to the British and rest of the world. The free labor subsidy of the South was making it more difficult to industrialize and compete with British and European manufacturing. The South, as you know, was gaining more from the raw product export and hence disagreed. They believed that the comparative advantage of the rich land and free labor means that they don't need to industrialize as they don't need to particularly compete with European manufacturing. That's what the war was really about, and not emancipation of a subjugated minority. Now this is not an arbitrary distinction, because it's crucial to understanding the social development of the African American community in the post-Civil War years. Because if the war was fought for emancipation, the post-war state policy towards the African American community would have been much different to what it actually was. Immediately after the Civil War, the victorious North shunned the black community and began the appeasement of the South to unify the country. Lincoln's successor and Vice President Andrew Johnson became the president after to redress the perceived imbalance between North and South. He opposed legislating any policy that even attempted to bring the black community into mainstream American society and lived the American dream just like any other American. There were voices in the US that advocated that post-Civil War strategy should be to support the newly freed slave by allocating land and livestock for a new start. But these voices were very swiftly silenced, as appeasement of the South was more important for unity than the lives of a subjugated community. This left most of black America on the margins of society that were restricted to engage in this economy. To be fair, not just by the ruling class or the South either. One of the more profound books I've read on this subject is called How the Irish Became White that depressingly illustrates how even the working class made every effort to restrict black America from participating in the economy and truly become Americans. Recently freed slaves often moved towards the north of the country to find menial labor jobs, and the hangover of this racist-based culture meant that the immigrant Irish working community could not accept the black community to be doing the same job as them and actively participated in restricting them from trying to get any kind of work. The left-wing labor movement of the US, these hard-working blue-collar folks, were in formal consensus about excluding the black community as they could not even appear to be associating with them. Just to be clear, I'm not arguing over here that the African American community was some passive society throughout their history. They really fought hard against this injustice. Through civil movements, many enterprising African Americans, against all odds, beat the system and joined the mainstream of society, outperforming their white counterparts and forced other Americans to look at them as fellow human beings, as fellow Americans by becoming educated and participating in the American dream and followed the standards set by the settler founding fathers. But a large number of black community just couldn't. When you're denied education, basic human rights and respect, surprise, surprise, it takes a toll on your society's social development. In many hoods of America today, the African American community still lives in miserable conditions that most Americans couldn't even fathom living in. They are looked at by their ruling class and many fellow Americans 
as lazy, unwilling to chase the American dream by not educating themselves and living a life of crime and drugs by choice. Basically, not embodying the Protestant ethic that gives you the inherent right to call yourself an American. This is obviously reflected in the attitudes that the police and state have towards these communities. And if a person perceived to be from this community is shot dead, it genuinely matters less to them. The attitude for society to deal with them is through harsh measures and forceful policing. The courts aren't sympathetic towards hood rats. They will almost always favor the perceived earnest police officer that puts his life at risk to defend productive members of society from criminals. Most deaths in the US by authorities is of a demographic that's black, but also live in these poverty stricken hoods. If the same level of shootings happen in a neighborhood that was middle class or upper class, the entire state apparatus would activate to protect them. But since it's not them, hood lives do matter less.